Okay, so I'll just quickly run through these exercises. Did anyone have any problems with them? Anything in particular? I'm going to talk through maybe. Um, so, create a vector containing the values one, two, three, four, five. Let me make this a little bigger uh, if I can. Um, great, that's easy enough. We have the numbers we want. We could just copy them. Um, C, we'll use the combine function and we'll just put in our numbers separated by comma. We're going to assign it to a new variable x, which will be our numeric vector. Okay. This isn't going to work. One, two, three, four, five. If I want to go one to a hundred, I'm not sure if anyone actually bothered typing it out. But we can start to use our shorthand one colon hundred, or we can do seek one from one to one hundred by equals one, and we get our vector one to a hundred. If um, we want to do a vector which is zero to 20, but skips and goes up in intervals of five, we'll use the seek function we saw earlier on. Although I haven't specified it's from two by equals five. And this is, I know the order, so I haven't put in the variable names. Get a vector containing the values one, one, two, two, three, three. I think that's just as easy to type it in, to be honest. But just to make use of repeat, I repeat one twice, I repeat two twice, I repeat two, two twice, and then I combine them all together. Did anyone else have an alternate solution for that? There is, there is a way of doing that. I can show anyone at the end. Create a vector containing one, one, five, seven, nine, ten. I think I'm just trying to be tricky. Uh, do that, and then I combine that with seek. So I get my two ones repeated. Seek five to nine, five, seven, nine by two. And then I just added pen onto the end. So just creating irregular ways of making vectors. Create a vector containing the values one to 10. We'll just do that shorthand here, one to 10. Create a new vector with all but the first and last value. So we know that it, how long it is, right? We just created a vector of length 10. So we can use the negative indexing here. Let me actually do this now. This is a useful example, actually. Um, so if I got R open. So if I assign X to be one to 10, to the really bottom of the screen, that's kind of annoying. Um, if I assign, X to be one to 10. If I want to get the first value, that's easy, it's one. If I want to get the last value, I know it's 10. So I could just do that. But the last value of a vector is always the same as the length of the vector. Okay, so if you want to take out the last value, you can always just do X length, I can't type. So that's how you get the last value of a vector. And that's something we're going to have to do a lot. If I want to get everything apart from the last value, I do minus, and then here I just combined those two together. You see one and this evaluates to be 10. Everything apart from the first and last value. Um, and then I can do the same, but much, much less interesting example, everything apart from the second and the fifth, and assign it to a new variable here. Here I'm actually explicitly saying second and fifth. Create a square, I have the new vector of root, the square root of the sixth and seventh position. Okay. So to get the sixth and seventh position, sorry, um, I can just do X and I can tell it give it a vector here of six and seven. What's kind of useful to know here is the square root can be applied to a vector. And if I do it, square root will give me the square root of the first value and the second. Right? So it doesn't just need to be a single number, it just needs to be a single vector going in and it will operate on every element in the vector. So do something a bit more. Square root, uh, that's not right. That's definitely not right. So 
So I think it's just a nice example of applying square roots to multiple numbers, make getting us the results as another vector. Create a vector of alternating, alternating positions in the vector using another vector. So here we're just going to use seek, and this will create uh, one, three, five, seven, nine. I can use that to subset X. Okay, this is interesting. Find the number of files in the present working directory. So if I run DIR, and this you'll all get a different result for this, depending on what you set as your present working directory and what files you set. So that's my two files. And then I can just apply this one function we've learned length. List the first file. I can just do that with assigning it to X. These are all my files, and then I can just index and get the first file uh, in the working directory. Create a vector of the gene names gene one, two, three, four. Create a vector of expression values as so, and gene lengths as so. So we just use the combine function three times here. Combine, get our genes, get our expressions, get our gene lengths. The useful thing to do here now is because these are all in the same order, we can actually assign the names from our gene names to our expression values and our gene lengths using this names vector. Um, using the names function, assign it the gene names, and then we get the same as just the values here, but we know the actual gene name associated to that. So now we can do something like find the longest gene. We should have seen max. So if I do max gene lengths, it's going to give me the longest possible gene length. And maybe I can just run a bit of this just so we can see it in action. Okay. I've got gene lengths. The gene lengths we're looking at. I do max on that, it gives me the value for the longest gene length. And if I want to know which position was the longest gene length, I could do gene lengths. Which one was the max? It's telling me the second one was the max. And if I want to know what that was, I could then subset down to that. And then I know it's gene two there, I can see the name but I could extract that name directly just by doing this. Oh. There is an alternative. So max, when I did max gene lengths, it gave me the birth of what the actual value for max was. And then I had to look it up to say which one of these, sorry, which one of these was the one with the maximum length. There is an alternative one I haven't shown you which is called which.max. If I do which.max on gene lengths, this actually returns to me which one was the maximum. Okay, so it's telling me the second one was the maximum, and it's actually giving me gene lengths. Um, well, Identify genes with a length greater than 100 and expression value greater than 10,000. And we can just here, just kind of copy and paste that, or even just, we can just look at it here. So all this is is an example of using two vectors to create a logical operation and combining them by using the and. So anywhere we have gene lengths greater than 100 and the expression was greater than 10,000, subset the gene names down to them. And then that should be very easy. It should just give us gene four. Okay, the last ones here, I call them bonus questions because these are gonna come up in the next session as well once we start to look at tables. Calculate the expression over the gene length for all genes. So I'm not sure I phrased that particularly easy to understand. So this will be very simple RNA-seq. You would normalize to the gene length. The longer a gene, the more chance of having signal on it is long. So one way to do that is just to divide expression by the gene lengths. Really, I just like this because it's a nice example of dividing one vector by another, that vector by that vector. 
and it will do it in this pairwise divide the first one by the first one, second one by the second one. Once we have that value, we could just again apply some simple statistics here. I just want to know which one of my new vector calculated length normalized expression is greater than the mean of that vector. And I can use that to subset my gene names and it's telling me gene one, is greater than, gene three, sorry, is greater than the mean. So just this one was greater than the mean. Okay, so that's um, vectors. Let me know if you have any problems or any questions. I'll be here after this session as well, so we can go through it. I'm gonna make this small again. The next thing we wanna talk about is matrices. So whereas vectors are just one dimensional and ordered, matrices are two dimensional and ordered. Actually, that's not true. They're multi-dimensional, but typically we look at them as two-dimensional. And actually, most of the time when we're working with numbers, I won't go too far from my laptop. Am I recording? Most of the time, um, when you look at data, it kind of looks like this in Excel. We have um, values here in light blue. And for each of these values, we will have column names and row names. So at the moment, we've just dealt with names, and that's, a, that's good for a single dimension. But if we want to find two dimensions, you know, row position, column position, or row name and column name should get us there. So we're used to looking at tables. Um, and in R, one of the most basic type of tables is something called a matrix. Uh, most programming languages have the idea of a matrix, and they are all very similar. We can create a matrix in R, surprisingly, by using the matrix function. We just need to give it a couple of arguments. We need to tell it what data we want to put in the matrix. And we need to tell it the number of rows and the number of columns. These obviously, hopefully, need to be compatible. So here I'm telling it, make five rows uh, and two columns. I'm giving it the data one to 10. And you can see it fills up our matrix by column. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I can do the same kind of dimensions, but in reverse. N row equals two, N col equals five. It's a wide matrix now, but it still works by column. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> like I just said, spelling it by column by default. A lot of the time, actually, we want to work by row when we're filling these things in. And sometimes we're converting a vector to a matrix. You may want to go by row. We can very easily tell our function matrix to go by row just by saying by row and now setting that to be true. So without setting this argument, it's gonna go down the columns. By setting by row equals true, it's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Find the dimensions of matrix, similar to how we have length to give us the length of a vector. We have a few functions for matrices. We have dim, which will give us the rows and the columns five rows, two columns. We have n row, which will give us five rows, and n col, which will give us uh, two columns. Number of rows, number of columns, dimensions. A matrix can actually be created, and a lot of the time you will use this function, but a lot of the time you're going to get your matrix from reading in from a file. So you're not actually going to create matrices, uh, but using the matrix function too often. But you may find you want to join two matrices together quite often. So C bind and R bind are a family of functions which allow us to join by column or by row matrices. So the first one is column bind, C bind. And this allows us to attach data to a matrix as columns. Okay, so here I'm just going to create a vector one to five. I'll create one which is 11 to 15. So these are the same length. Should be able to just stick them together. And then I'll create Z, which has only got a length two. 
Now, if I C bind X and Y, we get this matrix which we've created, and it's our matrix column bound. So it's one to five down here, 11 to 15 here. And what's also nice is it's assigned for us column names. So if we look when we made the matrix before, there are no column names by default. It's just one, two, three, four, five. One, two. It's telling us the column position and the row position. When I used X and Y and C bind, it tried to do something clever for us and it called the first column X and it called the second column Y, which is quite neat. Similarly, we can use R bind to bind by row. So we want to add something to the bottom. And here, um, I now get my Z at the bottom, but I also get a row name for Z. I don't have row names for the rest of them, but because I was R binding, it's taken the actual vector name Z and it's attached that as a can be useful. In the same way that we have this warning about recycling for vectors, when I tried to add two vectors together and they weren't compatible lengths, we're going to have that problem with matrices in some situations, and it's going to give us a very similar warning. So here I'm going to say, give me a matrix one to five. I want two columns, but I want three rows. So I need six values, but I've only got five. It's going to give me this warning. The warning, matrix, data length five is it's not a sub, multiple and multiple. And it's going to do that similar recycling. Where it's going to go one, two, three, four, five. And then it's going to start from the beginning of the vector again and put one. There are a few situations where that's actually useful to you. Um, but it will give you a warning if you make that mistake. Um, similarly, we have the same problem with R bind at all vectors. Um, and in this case, this longer vector is going to be clipped. So if I try R bind our recycled matrix two, which is this here, one, two, three, four, five, one. And I try and give it five things to kind of bind to the matrix. So I try and give it a vector of length five. It can't give me this incompatible matrix that says one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So it clips the longer one. And it just gives me the first two. So it's going to give you the warning, but this is what it's going to try and do to fix the situation. Not very rarely, if you are in a situation you actually want it to proceed, you probably want to fix what's happening. So we saw that it automatically assigned some row names and column names here. We have previously seen um, we can assign names to vectors. We can do exactly the same here. Once we've created our matrix, I can use the col names function as opposed to the names function. And here I'm going to assign uh, some new names, which I'm creating using a paste function. Let me show you a little bit what this paste function. Occasionally, I'm going to expose us to new functions as we go along. We can always just do paste. Have a little bit about what paste does. Concatenate strings, so it joins strings together. One or more objects which be converted to a character vector. So we give it our character vector, and we tell her the character string to separate our terms. So how it's going to kind of concatenate these things together. So if I just run this line, I can see that I've set set to be underscore. And it's going to connect column to a vector of one to five. And it's going to separate the column from these values by the separator underscore. Okay, so we have column names, which are reasonably sensible, column one to five. In the same way, we have row names. I just call them row. I just need two of them. Separator is underscore. Now we have a named matrix. So I don't need to just have uh, numbers across the top. I have my column one to five, row one to five. Similarly, just as I can use names to both set my names and to retrieve them, I can also use col names to get the names from the top of my matrix and row names to get the names from my rows. We saw, we saw how we could um, subset a vector using square brackets and indices. And a vector is an ordered collection of values, right? So we can go one, get the first, fifth, get the fifth. Actually, in matrices, it's very, very similar. 
except we need to get an X and Y. We need to know what column and row we want. So we can do that then just by using the square brackets. And now we have to set before a comma, the row of interest we want and after the column, comma, the column of interest. And we could already see that kind of in place when we built the matrix. Because here you can see it's comma one for this column. That's the first column. Column two, that's the second column. One comma nothing is the first row. So it's already showed us a little bit about that. Okay, so if we have our narrow matrix now, this is our one we created earlier on, and I want to get second row, first column, it's going to be rows, then columns. I can just see it here as well. It's going to be two, one. So if I set square brackets two, comma one, pull out that value, and that's that position I want. Similarly, we can actually get whole rows or columns in one go. And we can retrieve a column or a row as a vector. Right? Vectors effectively make up matrices. So if I want to get the second column, I could do narrow matrix, I do my square brackets, I put nothing before the comma, right? so I don't want to specify any particular row, but after the comma, I specify I want the second column. And then it's going to pull out the second column here. Similarly, I could do that for the row and pull out the third row. I can also apply kind of multiples of this. So if I want to take, I just like the vectors, two rows at a time, I can take two and three. It's going to give me the second and the third row. So the second and the third row. Um, but because I'm taking two rows, it's going to return to me a matrix. Right? It's not going to return to me a vector. We already set our column names, but here I guess I'm resetting them again. <clears throat> but column names can be used to retrieve just like indexing by names in a vector. So if I want to get the column called column one, which will be the first column, just remind us what that looks like. Yeah. I think this matrix is a little different looking. I could just do comma, and rather than giving the position of the actual on the matrix I want, the first column, second column, I can give the name of the column. Similarly, if I want to do the row, I can just give the name of the column. So when we start reading in tables from Excel or CSV files, we're going to read them in so that we get those column names and row names set for us. And we'll probably use something like this to be able to extract all this. You can obviously use two together. And again, rather than getting a vector, we're going to get just a single value. We go to say row one, column one. <laughs> just like with vectors, we can apply the same logic. So if we want to do things like create logical expressions from this, here I'm going to subset my first column right, so I get all the values and then I can use that subsetted values one to five and say which one of those values is less than five and it's going to tell me the first four right? true 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 false so then I can get a logical vector from my matrix just by asking first column which of these are less than five now we can do more indexing but again with two dimensions, we can do something slightly cleverer. And we're going to say, from that first column, give me this true, false, whether or not the value is less than five, and then subset my whole matrix by row before the comma and extract the values. <clears throat> As with vectors, and we're not going to deal with matrix multiplication here. Very simple arithmetic operations. Matrices can have arithmetic operations applied to cells, rows, columns, or the whole matrix. So if I want to add two to the value of narrow matrix there, I can just do one, one, that will pull out my first value. I add two to this, and I get three. I can also do a whole row, <coughs> and I can do narrow matrix, First row here, one comma, so it's going to be the first row. 
and I'll add in two, which will give me three and three and eight. Three, yeah, two, three and eight. I can also apply arithmetical operations to the whole matrix. <clears throat> so in this case, I'll use the mean function. And I won't subset, I'll just apply it to the whole matrix and it will give me the mean. I don't know. Just like that. As with vectors, matrices can also have their elements replaced. And we do it in exactly the same way as we do with vectors, except we just need to be a bit more explicit because we've got two dimensions. So I can replace the first column, first row one with 10. That gives me 10. But if I decide I can replace in one go, either all the row, one whole row or one whole column, and here I will do the whole of column two, this column here, and I replace that with one. So we can operate on matrices, arithmetic operations, replacement, subsetting using vectors, uh, sorry, using logical vectors, just as we have done for standard vectors. One thing which is uh, frustrating about matrices, um, and it, you know, internally you can understand why, um, it we want a matrix to be all one data type so that it can apply an operation to the whole table. So this makes a problem um, because if we accidentally add a character or a string to anywhere within our matrix, the whole matrix is going to become a string. Okay, and I can really show that in practice. So this is our narrow matrix, one to five, six to ten. And it looks like this. So if I times the second row by two, it's going to give me, I've just set the whole of the second row to be one here. It's going to give me a sensible result. It's going to turn every one, it's going to times it by two, so I get two, 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 two. If I then set one of my values, just one value in my matrix to be a string, you can see that ones and twos are no longer true numerics. They're wrapped in this quote, which means they're actually like a string, rep <clears throat> a string representation of two. And this just means now if I try and times that second column by two, it thinks that it's a string and it's not going to allow me to do that numeric operation. Matrices can only be one data type, logical, character, numeric. The whole matrix has to be it. So we have an exercise on matrices here. I would actually like to just push forward a little bit more to our second session, uh, which is factors. And we'll come back to this matrix kind of class, uh, exercises at the end of this. So a special case of a vector, and I think this is something which is really cool about R, is data frames and factors. And like, this is something which Python has worked hard to copy using the Panda library and various other libraries. So a special case of a vector is a factor. So factors are used to store data which may be grouped into categories. And a lot of our data is grouped into categories. So um, it's often very important and useful inside R. By specific, specifying this data as categorical, by saying it's a factor, it's actually going to allow R to handle this data slightly differently. So it means certain functions will operate on it differently. And you will see as we get further on in our analysis, the factors are actually important for things like plotting um, because they have this concept of levels. So what is in my data, what categories are in my data. And it's also really useful for some analysis later on. Okay, so to create a factor from a vector, it's very easy. We just create our vector first. And then we'll do here, uh, male, female, female, female. And that creates a vector, like our standard vector. If I then apply the factor function to that, it then turns this in to a factor uh, R object. And if you can let's just look at that inside the actual, when you try and you know, type that in and see what R prints out. 
It's going to print out something which looks like a vector. It's going to give you the order, male, female, female, female. But then it's going to give you what it calls levels. And those are all the categories present in that factor. Okay, so in this case, we have female and male. Those are the two categories in this vector. By default, R is going to put them alphabetical order. So it's going to put female first. This may affect us later on. This levels order slightly affects the order that comes out in plots. When we do differential analysis, it will choose female as our baseline. Right? So levels are important. And we'll show you how to manipulate them later on. If I just want to have a look at what levels I have in a factor, I can just do levels, give it the factor, and it will tell me. So levels is also very much like running unique on a vector, right? It's going to give you just unique instances um, of the categories in your uh, here. One thing we can do straight away different, if I run summary on a vector containing the same information, so this is my vector example, I just apply factor to that and I turn it into a factor example. If I do summary on that, the first one's kind of I'm still useful. So it tells me the length, it tells me the class character, it tells me the mode character. If I do a summary of the factor, it gives me the occurrence, right? So it's already done some type of statistical transformation. It's told me how often females were in there and how often males were. Right? I have three females and one male. So just by doing summary on a factor, it will do something different. So summary will do something different on a factor than it does on a vector. So in our fact example, like I was saying, uh, they're just displayed in alphabetical order. We need to adjust these levels sometimes. And if anyone knows, when I mentioned things like ggplot2, these complex, really nice ways of doing our graphics, we need to have control over these levels. We can upfront set the levels when we create the factor. So we can go factor, give it the uh, vector we want to turn into a factor. And here I'm going to express explicitly say levels, male, female. Back to example. Now, if I do a summary of that, you can see male came first and female came second. It checks the order of the, fact, the uh, levels before it makes this little summary. So it's female first here, male second, just by altering the levels and the order here. So, in some cases, there is no natural order. Right? We wouldn't say one is greater than the other. Right? Maybe there's an order in how we would like to plot it and set it out. But in this case, you know, we couldn't say one factor is greater than the other. It's just not, it's just not all that ordinal type of data. So with this factor, with these levels, if I try and say, is the first factor greater as the first um, element in my factor, which was male, less than a female, now it's going to go, nope, that makes no sense. It's not meaningful. We're trying to compare two, two things which don't have an implicit order. So it's going to give me this valuable value, value NA. We saw that earlier on, not available. I can't give you anything. We can, however, actually give our categories some type of order by calling it ordinal data. And to do that, all we need to do is add a additional argument to our factor uh, function. And we just say ordered equals true. And in this case, it's going to be um, small and then big. So if we say ordered equals true, the levels here now mean the order of kind of accession. So here we have factor example. And the levels, rather than just being separated here, it's done this less than. As well. So now we know small is less than big. And now I can start to do these comparisons. Give me all those facts, give me a factor or test whether the first one is actually less than the second one. Small, uh, big, and I've told it that's the order. So yeah, that's true. 
So functors allow us to do just a little bit more with a, a vector by providing these levels and potentially putting order on these levels. The real pain with a factor is that replacing elements in a factor isn't so easy. We, we showed you earlier on, we could just take and replace an element in a vector. We can just replace an element in a matrix. It was okay as long as they're the same data type. Um, but with a factor, if I try now to replace, say, uh, the first one with big, that's gonna be fine. It's gonna help me, allow me to replace that. If I try and add a new value to my factor, which didn't appear in the levels, right? So it's not aware of this um, in its level. So it's not a category, it's been described. So I try and put huge, it tells me just that. Warning, in fact, invalid uh, factor level, NA produced. Okay, so saying it's invalid because I don't have that huge inside my list of potential levels. And it just fills it with an array. It's actually kind of annoying, but that's the way it works. To add a new level, we can actually use the levels argument. So I can set levels on my factor. Um, and here now I'm going to add huge. And now if I assign the first one to be called huge, you can see I don't get an NA. It accurately fills it. That's great, we got that way. There will be data frames today. I've lost track of what time we actually should be going. It's until four this session. I will stop a bit early. I don't want to overwhelm us. Today. Okay, so vectors and then matrices, simple ways of holding data. Vector is one dimensional, ordered, a matrices, a matrix. Is two dimensional, still ordered, must contain one type of data. A factor is like a vector, but it has this concept of categories. A data frame is an excellent contribution by R to the general programming environment. And really, it allows us to have this table, except every column can contain different types of information. And actually, tables can be really, really complex. Um, and what they contain within them. So in this case, we may have a, I'm not sure, <coughs> this one we don't, but perhaps this would be a factor. Maybe this would be gene names, would be a character. This would be a new name. So we have to have a quick drink. Um, in R, we can make use of a data frame object, uh, which allows us to store tables with columns of different data types. Um, data frames usually, matrices will hold typically our numeric output from our assay or something. We know it's all numeric. Data frames are great for holding your metadata. Right, this sample has this numeric value, this category, uh, this name, gene name. This is why data frames are so good. So in this case, we're going to use this data frame uh, function to create a data frame from three different types of um, uh, variables. So we have patient name, and that's a standard vector. We have a factor made up of a vector of male and female. So I think I just repeat that twice, and then I turn that into a factor. I haven't set levels, so it will just be in alphabetical order. And then I'm going to give a numeric vector here, 1, 30, 2, 20. And then to create the data frame, I'm just going to do data frame. And in there, I put the name of the column I want, and I assign the value to that name. So I want name. I want a column called name. I want it to have the patient name. I have a column called type, and I want it to have the patient type. I have survival time, and I want to confirm that. Okay, so now we have our first data frame containing different types of data along our columns. Data frames can act just like matrices in terms of indexing. So in this case, even though I've got mixed data, I can still operate on this as if it's numeric. Remember in a matrix, 
as soon as I added a character, I could no longer operate on any column as if it was numeric. Here I can, and I can do data frame example. I will subset down to the survival column. And then from that column, I just want to know which of them are above 10. And that's what I will use to index the rows of my data frame. So it's just going to look down there, this column. It's going to find the ones where they're above 10. It's those ones. And then subset down to them. And I have my whole data frame subset just on, based on that column. A nice feature of um, data frames, though, is that we don't need to necessarily use the square brackets. We can actually pull out a column by just doing this dollar sign. So it's the name of your data frame, which I just created called DF example. And then I can just do dollar, dollar. And then I type in the name of the column and it will take out or pull out that column for me. So similarly, I can kind of replace this one here where I do the square brackets and I comma and then the name of the column. I can just do dollar name of the column and that will give me the same result. What's really cool about that is that R will allow some level of auto completion. So as long as this here after the dollar is enough to uniquely name a column, identify a column, it's going to pull out that column of interest. So I don't think any of my columns were particularly, yeah, uh, survival time type and name. I could do dollar S. There's only one column it could come, potentially come from. So that's a nice feature of R, and it really separates it a little bit from the non-interactive languages. And obviously, if you're in the uh, interactive session, uh, R, R Studio will fill in the rest of the main field. Okay, so this is going to work if I do DF example, serve. If I, as long as I do it with a dollar, it will work. If I try and specify a shortened version of a name in the quotes, it ain't going to work needs to be filled within the quotes. What's really nice about this dollar thing is that I can now start to create columns on the fly. I don't need to create a vector and then C bind it with my data frame. I can say dollar new column. And I want it to contain repeat new data for the number of rows I have in this data frame. And then it will just create a column called new column and fill it with the data I specified there. We can do the same or similar assignment that we did for the less complex data types. Um, so here, if I want to replace parts of my survival time column, right? this is a numeric column, so it's very easy. I just specify the rows I want to operate on. So I'm saying anything with survival time less than 10 in the survival time column, now just set them to zero. So maybe I'm, I'm baselining here. I'm saying if it's less than 10, it might as well be zero. So I specify the rows I want to operate on. I tell it I want to replace within the survival time column. And I assign zero. Easy. But we have the same issue because data frames allow us to have factors, vectors, and make you know other types of objects within them. They can have a character vector or a numeric vector side by side. Uh, our first column or second column here, sorry, was a factor when we created it. So I created this column and I called it factor, rep, male, female. This means uh, when I try and replace anything within that column with something which wasn't originally in that column, the levels won't be in there. So sadly, it's going to send a invalid factor level type, or sorry, other wasn't in my original list. It wasn't in the female or male. So it's going to put an NA. This is just like as if I was working on a factor, except now my factors within the data frame. So, you know, we can fix that again. And we just have to do something similar to what we did with an individual factors. I've recreated the data frame here because I just destroyed it. And now what I'll do, operating on that second column type I'm going to set the levels to be something new. And what I'm going to do is take the previous levels, 
and just combine them with the other and effectively just adding le another level to it. And now if I replace type with other, we can see we have a data frame and this has gone in. No warnings, I've managed to work on my, I'm just gonna get a sense of where I am. Um, data frames, name, patient X. I guess that's just to show that it doesn't matter when you're working on standard kind of characters. If this is a numeric, this is a factor, this is a character. I can easily replace inside the character uh, column, just put patient X. Because it's a character, it's not going to give me any problems. A really useful, oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, so what happens if you, you've already added something to your data frame? Uh, no, it's not like a control Z um, inside R. So yeah, you would actually either have to work back through your history, but yeah, you pretty much have to rerun it. Um, yeah, that's, that would be a shame. So I think there is an equivalent of control Z and R, but there really isn't in this. Now, maybe in R Studio. Maybe R Studio has some extra wrapper or something. You know? um, this, the sensible thing to do, and what we'll show you later, is you can actually save objects as you go along. Um, and I'm going to show you that later in the next session. So if you've got a really big object and it takes a long time to build, you don't want to risk accidentally destroying it, you save it, and then you just operate on that object. You can like load it back in if you see. Good question. Um, so order. So order um, for numeric vectors, order by default returns the indices of vectors in that vector's increasing order. Okay, so let's see this in actual action. Um, we have this test order 20, 10, 30. So if I just look at it, it's 20. Um, I want to get the order here increasing equals true. It's going to go from the highest, which would be the third one, then the first one, then the second one. And that's what it has here. The third one's the highest, first one's the second highest, and the third one is uh, P, is the smallest. If I change decreasing, if I didn't set decreasing equals true, it would do it in the opposite order. Two, one. By returning these indices to us, like the indices of the order they should be in, it actually just means we can slide that in to the indices in square brackets, and then we can get our vector back in the right order. So here, if I do order without decreasing equals true, and I supply that within the square brackets, See, it's going to give me reordered. If I do it now with decreasing to true, it would be in the highest. When a vector contains NA values, it's the first time I talked about how we do deal with NA values. When it contains NA values, these NA values will default, by default, be placed last in the ordering indices. So if somewhere in my set of things I want to order, there's an NA. R will do the ordering and then it will place the NA at the bottom. That's worth noting because sometimes when you order a table, you've got to remember the bottom of the table isn't necessarily the lowest value. It could be NA. Values. If we're worried about that, and for whatever reason I want to take the bottom of the table, we can actually change NA last and false, and it will put the NAs at the top of the table. It just wants to deal with them in a sensible way. Right, so it's either going to have to put them at the bottom separately or at the top. To keep them out of it. Questions? So then this order function becomes really useful with matrices. And I want to reorder my data frame by those who live longest after cancer treatment. I can do my data frame here. And I can then 
passing the order to the row indexes. That's what I want to order. And I'm going to say order by this column, the survival column. I don't need to say the full name because it's dollar. So dollar serve is going to be this column. Decreasing equals true, so it's going to order it from highest to lowest, and I'm telling it to operate just on the rows. It's going to order my data frame by row using that highest index. You can also use order operate on many columns. Occasionally, you're going to have ties, or maybe I want to know order within our type here first, male or female, and then I want to order by survival. So to do that, I can use an example. Uh, I can do the order. I give it the first part of the data I want to order by here. First, I want to order by type. And then within type, I want to order by survival. And then I want it all to be decreasing. A really common operation. Again, we don't have many people learning R here, right? We have to learn. So there are a few ways to join tables together. The base way, the way which comes with R, is using this function called merge. Okay. So if I want to join two data frames together, but I'm not sure they're in the same order, I, I have some options. I can either order one of the tables and make sure they are in the same order and try and see bind them together. But what's actually probably most useful is if there's a function which can take, you know, I say that this col column is what to join them by. This is the common, common column. Use that column then to join them together. Okay, so here I have two data frames, um, patient name, patient type, survival time. And I have a second data frame which has a common column, patient name, that has additional information in terms of how. So I want to integrate these two. Typically, it's going to be we'll have a table of gene expression. Maybe we'll have a table of gene and a function. We might want to piece together. To do that, we're going to use this function called merge. Merge can only take two data frames at a time. I can't give it 10 data frames. So I need to loop through if I want to do lots and lots of data frames. We'll learn about loops next time. But if I just want to join, join two tables, I can do merge. I give it the two tables I want. This is table X. This is table Y. And then I say by. And here I specify the column number to merge by. Uh, here's maybe patient one, two, three. Um, I tell it uh, all. So if I say all equals true, it's going to try and keep information from both tables, and it will fill in missing information with 10 eggs. If I say all equals false, it's only going to give me uh, information from these data frames where it has something in common. So in this case, I've said all equals false. I don't have any information from patient four. Right? So we didn't have any height information. I only have information on the first. Only those in common. <laughs> Okay, and then I guess let's pass it. So I think for today I'm going to call that as the end. We have a quarter of an hour I think left for this session. So it is our intro day, um, and I want to upload some of these videos to start as a good uh, start our YouTube uh, this in a good way. We have actually two exercises we covered. They're both going to be on tables. So I don't think we've done the matrices one yet. This should be quite straightforward, quite short. What you can see is that this thing we calculated previously, length normalized expression, I showed you how to calculate that in the last example, last exercise. So if you get lost, just go back. I think I probably show you where I say that, hint, we calculated it here. For the data frames, I think it's a little trickier. Um, Um, yeah, so give yourself some time now. What I will do is I'll come back in around 4.30 and I will see how we're all doing. Um, and if people are happy enough, I will start to go through the exercise. Yeah.
because this is the end of the session, please do not feel you need to stay in this room. If you want to go off back to your lab, if you want to go, as long as you come back on the Zoom to run through it, that's fine with me. I will be in the room up until that point, and I will run through the exercises here if you want to come talk to me. But I don't expect you guys to hang around just to wait for me to go through the exercise then. You can do that anyway. I'm going to pause my recording. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off today by running through these exercises. If you have any issues, any problems, any questions, let me know. Or alternatively, if you would like to, you can also um, find my way back there <clears throat> for every page. If you are lost, you can try our getting help and you can log your question and you get a nice answer from someone in my team. Let me delete my question. I'll have to do that later. Okay. Okay, so where are we? Matrices. So we have two sets of exercises, matrices first, and then factors and data frames second. So create a matrix containing information on gene names, expression values, and gene lengths. And I think this might just be the same data we had previously separately as vectors, now as um, a matrix. I guess the first trick here is um, we have gene names, so they're going to be names, they're going to be a string. And the expression and the lengths are going to be vectors of numeric. So we want to keep them separate, but we want to take advantage of having these names, right? We know that we can't have a matrix of mixed numeric and character. So the best way to do this is to get everything into a vector. So we have our gene names, our expression and gene lengths. I create three different vectors. I C bind the expression and the gene lengths together. So by doing that, I'm going to get a column called expression and a column called gene lengths. But then I don't want to C bind additionally the gene names because it will ruin my matrix. So I set the row names for my matrix to be the gene names. Okay. Well, that's a sensible thing to do because now we can just use the gene names as indexes when we want to get Gene three, what's its expression level? I can just index it. And update the matrix to contain the expression over gene length. So this is this length normalized expression and we have the solution in the last one. Here, I'm just gonna take the column of expression and I'm gonna subset my expression column with the standard indexing. It's a column, so it's after the comma. Yeah. And then I name the column I want to take. And I want to divide it by the length. So I can do a similar trick where I just subset my matrix to the gene length column, comma gene lengths. This gives me a new vector. And then with that new vector, I can now C bind that there. It's all numeric. So I still have a valid matrix I can work on. Um, <clears throat> And then I just got a little bit more information there. If this was a data frame, and I, maybe I do this in the next exercise, we could directly assign a new column to our data frame very easily. Right? But it's not, it's a matrix. So we have to see bind it up. Okay. Create a smaller matrix containing genes longer than 200. So just a bit of logical indexing. I'm going to use the genes longer. So I'm going to use gene lengths column. So I will get my gene matrix, extract just the gene lengths column, and check to see if any values are above 200. I can then use that to subset my gene matrix by row. So it's comma. Um, and this comes before the comma, because I'm going by row. And then I should pull out just the genes or just a matrix of genes with gene lengths greater than 200 greater, not greater than equal. So we throw away gene three. Take a small matrix <clears throat> with just expression and LNE columns containing genes longer than 200, and expression greater than three. So really it's the same as above, except I have an and expression greater than 300. 
So I need to use my and logical kind of operator here. So it's as above greater than 200 and now looking in the expression column, that is greater than 300. And so that's going to give me the two, the rows I want. To get the columns for expression and LME, I just need to provide the uh, vector of the names of the columns I want. And it's going to do column name indexing. So it's just going to pull out the expression and the LME column. I could have put C13, uh, it would have a similar effect, right? But here, because they have column names, I can name a vector of column names I want to extract. Cool. Calculate the sum of expression and um, come on, calculate the sum of the expression and length columns for only genes with a length greater than 100. Okay, so what I could do here is I really, I want to subset first to just genes longer than 100. So I could do that using this kind of logical here, gene matrix, get a gene length column and just pull out the values longer than 100. Um, and then if I wanted to get the sum of the expression and the sum of the length column for these genes, I would then pull out the expression column for the rows which follow this. And then with that vector, I can apply sum. And I have to do separately for the gene lengths. So it's the same logical. I just pull out a different column. And again, I get sum. And then that would be my gene length sum, my expression sum. You could do this a different way. And I just wanted to give you an example here. You haven't seen this function yet. But there is functions row sums and col sums. And they will operate across all the columns in your matrix and give you the summaries right? and all the rows. The real advantage of cold sums, other than just we don't have to do two lines here, is cold sums is fast. Right? It's written actually not in R, it's written in C. We just call cold sums, and it's a lot faster than looping through and doing this kind of sum of individual columns. So we have to do the same subset. And then we tell it the two columns we're interested in. So it's going to actually create a matrix of only those greater than 100. And it's going to return just the expression in the gene lengths column. And if I apply col sums to that, it gives me the summary of all the columns in the matrix. It gives them as a named vector. So either of these solutions are good. This is the one you would have known how to do, maybe. But col sums is a nice function available. And there's equivalent row sums as well. So that was the first exercise. Let's have a look at the second set. Let me make sure I'm recording. I am recording. I think this is a little bit more complex. Okay. So this is both factors and data frames, and we have a few questions of factors. So the first one is create an ordinal factor named height. Containing high, mid, low, mid. So we've got a few different values. Um, we've got high, mid, and low. It's an ordinal factor, so it's not nominal. There is order here. So I need to create my vector, just copying what was above here. So what was here, and just copy that into a standard concatenation, uh, sorry, combine function. And then I put that within a factor function to turn this vector into a factor, but additionally, I provide the levels and the order I want, low, mid, high, and I say this is ordered. Okay. If I just didn't write the ordered, it wouldn't have this kind of less than, less than here, and it wouldn't be able to tell me high is greater than low. Okay, so it's important to put ordered here. Now, having done that, I can use a I can create a logical index. Um, and then we're using that logical index, create a new factor of those where the height is greater than low. Okay, so I've got my ordinal factor I just created here. Okay, I just say ordinal factor when it's greater than low. It knows from this rule here the order of um, low, mid, high. And then it's just going to subset my factor now to just those which pass this logical. So I don't have any low here anymore, just high and mid. But the levels didn't change. 
replace the last index in height with very high and create new factor with those greater than mid. Okay, so here already we have a problem, right? I'm asking you to replace a value within our factor with something which wasn't in our factor originally. I'm asking you to add very high when really originally we only had low, mid, high. So to do that, we need to either re-level our factor. In this case, I'm just creating a factor again from our previous factor. I'm telling it it's ordered again, but now when I write the levels, I add in low, mid, high, and the additional very high. Okay. So now when I assign it to the last value, and remember the last value is always the same as the length of the actual vector or factor we're looking at. And now assign very high, it's not going to break it very high is now in the levels and I can just use the same type of indexing to bring out just the values greater than mid. Okay. All this really just to show you you need to re-level if you want to add new categories which weren't in your factor. This is going to be a problem so often that we'll, we'll, we'll keep on running it through it in the exercises. Okay, create a data frame called annotation. Okay. We have the columns of gene names, gene one, gene two, three, four, five, five, ensemble gene names, great, pathway information, and gene lengths. Okay, so this is like information about the gene itself. Um, so we can just do that using the data frame function, and we just need to supply the relevant column names, however we want to call them, and then the, the in this case, I guess, just the, the character vectors or numeric vectors. Um, to build our data frame. So pretty simple, ensemble pathway, just copying what's up here and putting it inside the data frame function, but giving the columns names. So we have our first column, which is kind of metadata about the gene. Um, the second data frame we want to produce, sorry, and now contains uh, the gene names, but has some expression values associated to them. Okay, so this is like 1,000, 3,000, 10,000 values. Yeah, okay, we'll call that the expression values for sample one. And then we can have expression values now for sample two. And it's just going to contain not necessarily the same genes. Are these the same genes? But an additional gene here, and then some expression values. So this is very much like you would get from any type of RNA sequencing experiment. You're going to have data frames or information containing gene expression level. And then maybe in a separate file somewhere, you'll have some more information on those genes so that you can interpret them. And some frantic slack. So I just want to make sure everything's OK. Yeah. Um, OK, so then what we want to do is create a data frame containing only those gene names common to all data frames with all the information from annotation and the expression from sample one and sample two. So if we just want the gene names which are common to all data frames, that means when we start merging, we're gonna use the old equals false argument because we just need them to be common. So the first thing we'll do is we'll merge the annotation data frame with our sample data frame. In this case, it's a little bit more complex because they have to merge by different column numbers. So in this case, uh, annotation, I want to use the second column. So now I need to say by dot x, because this is x, this is y. Okay. If they were using the same column position, I could just say by equals and say you know, the position, the number of the column, which is common. Um, but because they're using different columns, yep then we'll have to, um, yeah, so for the annotation, we're using the ensemble, which is our second column, and that's the first column in these. I'm going to say by dot x equals 2, by dot y equals 1. All is false, and that's going to give us our table, which contains sample 1 information and the annotation. And we'll then merge sample 2 into this, and now I don't need to say by equals um, by equals x and by equals y. I just need to say by equals one. And um, I'm actually going to show you an R actually why why we do that. Mm 
let's just make these again. Annotation looks like this. Sample looks like this. Sample two looks like this. The columns we want to merge by are this column here. So there are a few ways we could do this. One is just to merge uh, annotation sample one. One. And I can either say by dot x, which is annotation, I will use the second column, by dot y, and we'll use the first column in here. And I can do all equals false. And that will give me just those in common. If I did all equals true, were there additional things? Yep, yeah, you can see I don't have an expression value, so it filled it in with NA. Another thing which I don't show here, but it should work. If they actually have the same column name, which they do here, I think, they're both called an ensemble. I don't need to say the position. I can actually say the name of the column I want to merge by. It's actually a lot easier. But in this case, for the example, I'm saying we're going to use the second column from annotation and the first column from sample one to merge by that column matching that column. But I might update the example to be honest and just do it using the uh, by and then actually saying the name of the uh, column we want to show. So once we've merged it, so let's say this is now uh, merge one. Once we've merged it, whatever column we merged by became the first column. Okay, so now when I want to merge in sample two, they're both got the first column. This is our merged file. First column is now ensemble. In sample two, the first column is also ensemble. So I can do, I just assign that to something. Uh -uh -uh. Oh, it's merged one, so I assigned it already. And then do merge one. I can either again say ensemble, but because the column position is the same now, I can do. That's what I was going to try and show you. So I can go back. For anyone, you know, as we move on on the classes, there are easier ways to merge multiple data frames, and I'm going to show you that in, in a little bit. In fact, I think in our next session, I'm going to show you how you can like, loop through and merge data frames from multiple files. So we've added them. Add two extra columns contain the length normalized expression for sample one and sample two. So now we can just do uh, expression X, so that's our first expression, um, over the gene lengths. I can assign this directly to a column now because this is a data frame, so I can just use dollar and give it the name of the column I want to create. And again, here I can do the same for my second one. And now I have my matrix, sorry, my data frame with my metadata information, my expression values and my actual length normalized expression here. Identify the mean length normalized expression across sample one and sample two for ONCE 06 gene. Mean length normalized expression. Oh, I see. So we should, we can, we can either assign row names here using ensemble. So I can actually add some row names to this data frame. Just makes it easier for me then to index. So here I'm just going to assign the row names to be the same as from the ensemble column. And then I can subset down to those rows there. And subset down to those rows, sorry, rows before the comma, rows before the comma. And then take the uh, column for sample one LNE, and take the column for sample two LNE. I can concatenate these two together, and then I take the mean of that. So effectively, I'm going to subset down to the ONS gene using our newly created row names. I use the column name to extract the sample length expression for that particular gene. 
and then I'm just going to put them back together into a vector using combine, and then I will take the mean of that. Actually, I don't need to combine them. I think mean would just work if I'd separated them both. Okay, for all genes, identify the log two fold expression in length normalized um, expression for sample one to sample two. So I just need to do um, one over the other. So I'm going to log transform the sample two LNE column. I will log transform the sample one LNE column. Once we're in log space, we do minus rather than divide. And that will give us our log two fold change. And then I just assign to this log two fold change vector some sensible gene name so I can look up and actually see the log fold change. I could have added it back onto the data frame. Maybe that would have been more useful. Finally, uh, identify the total length of genes in the glycolysis pathway. All we need to do here is take the glycolysis is take the pathway column. Just check that we only look at those which were actually glycolysis. So we can do equals equals here, glycolysis. And then I take the gene length column from that, which is here. And then I just take the sum of those values. Okay, so this is just manipulation of data frames really by <clears throat> subsetting by rows and then taking the relevant column before we take the sum. Okay. So that's our session for today. Um, 